Hey, good morning. Welcome to Hope Vineyard Church. Good to see you today. Uh, my name is Jim Wood. Welcome, everybody in person. Welcome online. Uh, my wife, Dee Dee, and I are the pastors here at Hope Vineyard, and it's a real joy to have you here to celebrate Jesus and worship together uh, in this gathering today. Um, if you are online, and you can feel free to, to log in even if you're in person, uh, make sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube so you can stay up to date with any uh, doings around here. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Dee Dee. She's going to be continuing our message series today. So if she comes up, why don't you give her a hand or give her a little snaps at home or a little clapping emoji. Good morning. Oh, I'm going to pray first just so I can calm my own nerves down. Father, I just thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're here with us, that you love us, that you are doing a work in our lives that you're doing work in the life of this church. And Father, we ask that you will um, just enter us, even as we breathe, Lord, that you would be our breath, that you would calm us, that you would open our ears and our hearts to what you're saying this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to be doing this with a little bit of imagery this to start with. So um, for some of you, this might be a new thing, or for some of you, you may have done this before with me. But I'm going to, um, if you're willing to participate, I'm going to ask that we just kind of um, picture a safe place. And we're not going to go anywhere out of the safe place that we're picturing today. So if there's a, a pl I'm going to ask that you maybe close your eyes or just think of a safe place that you enjoy. So, or, I mean, it could be a place that you've been to before. It could be a place that you'd like to go to. But just try to think of, um, just allow this image of a safe place to come to mind in, your, in yourself. And um, we'll just, I'm just going to be quiet for just a second so that you can do that. And we can ask Jesus to help us find this safe place. So Jesus, you know, let this be a safe place that you're, you're totally in agreement with. All right. Um, and, and it's okay. Like for some of you, this was a, is, is easy. You keep keep this. You can keep your eyes closed and keep this safe mind, um, safe place in mind, even as I'm talking. But some of you, this is an easy thing, and some of you, it's it's really not, and it's not your thing, and you might not be able to bring up an image real quick, and that's okay. So just remember what I've said, and even if you can't picture, you know, get it like visually, um, keep it in your mind. And now I'm going to ask Jesus that your presence would be there. So some of you might experience like a picture of Jesus or, or something, but some of you might not. I, but I do want the presence of love um, because God is love. So the presence of love, who is also Jesus, but we're just, it, so whether it's a, a you know, physical picture of Jesus or just a sense of love being present with you, I'm just going to ask that that um, be open to you as well. And now I'm just going to ask that um, as we go further into this message that you just keep that place, that safe, pla that safe place in your mind. So you don't have to keep your eyes closed the whole time, but just as loud as um, that you allow that, that kind of being present with you so that we're listening to this message along with the sense of safety in that place. And if you do start feeling anxious or, or something, you can quickly close your eyes and return to, or, or not, but you can, um, you can return to that sense of safety that hopefully you've had um, a sense of already. So this morning, we're going to be talking about um, healing, more healing to the soul, but also understanding that as our healing comes to our soul, that healing can sometimes come to our bodies. And so we talked a lot about how, um, you know, like despair or injury comes to our soul last week. And if you didn't um, listen to the message last week or watch it on Facebook, I would encourage you to go ahead and watch that because 
part of what we learned at the beginning of last week will be um, important for what we're talking about this week, but not entirely. So you won't, you know, it's it's still you'll still get something out of this message. So as we're we're talking about um, today, I want to talk a little bit about how our past affects our bodies or can affect our bodies, and. I want to share a little bit about um, something that I like. I recently experienced, maybe mm, probably about two or three years ago now, but it really, I as um, I, I didn't know at the time how related it was to my past, but I think I can understand it a little bit better now. And so, for some of you, I've talked about this before. How you know, when I was um, younger, I had. When I was in grade school, I had issues where there was some bullying that happened. Prior to that, um, I had some issues of insecurity. And I don't really have um, vivid recollection of any overt purposeful abuse toward myself. And yet, I have always experienced um, senses of distress that would relate to, you know, as I've ministered with people who have had kind of those experiences, I, w I would think, well, how come I'm having this kind of feeling of distress or sometimes overwhelming doom or anxiety or depression, and I hadn't really had any major, you know, like um, pivotal uh, experiences. And as some of you know, I've been you know, in inner healing ministry for almost 25 years now. I've participated in it. I've um, helped others in it. I've also, um, you know, worked with deliverance, and, and we've d I've done a lot of, of investigating on my own, um, even prior, probably, probably since I was in college, about different um, mental health issues, which in church language would be like, issues that are directly related to our souls. And a lot of times, if we leave it at a surface thing, then it seems like, well, there's just a problem that you have that Jesus can take care of. But when we, re when we look at our souls, we're also looking at our whole history. And so I've done a lot of, um, I've spent a lot of time in the, and have uh, had a lot of interest in this area. And so a couple, you know, s several years ago, I had, um, I, I lost my best friend and I felt through death and I, I felt like God was there with me and there was a lot of grace and um, I didn't feel like terrible despair and loss even though I did you know feel very sad at the loss of my best friend which was about five years ago this summer but at the same time I was um, we had another friend and and um, I had companionship still, and I had my, my husband was very supportive, and my children were very supportive during this time of loss. And I also it, um, had some experiences that were really exciting God experiences in ministry as well. And then um, do, oh, and also I wanted to mention that I had, had you know, like my, my, in my life, in, you know, from the time of bullying and on, I had s many seasons of being in community, being in close relationship with friendships, and then friendships ending. And um, and each time I learned and grew from that. And um, but many times I realized, like, well, I discovered what I did wrong, and I won't do that again. And even with Jesus, it was like I discovered, you know, like that I didn't have very good boundary issues, and then I won't do that again. And I feel like in this last uh, friendship that I had really mastered perfection. I was going to be a perfect friend, and I was never going to lose relationship again. And there were circumstances that I believe were beyond either of our control, and um, that relationship ended up um, being removed from my life. And I was, I was left with this terrible sense of despair and confusion. And I could feel it, it, you know, as the time went on, I could feel this physically in my body. And the physical ache from it was just like my arms just hurt so bad. And my body hurt so bad. And, 
And after a while, I, because I had had you know, much experience of, with alcohol in my youth, I thought, well, there, you know, I could go on for you know, several days in a row, but to give myself a break, I would you know, just drink enough alcohol in order to numb that feeling in my body of the pain in my arms, just so I could, it was, it was you know, I, I considered it medicinal. And, and I'm not condoning this, like, yeah, you all should do this, but I understood, I, I wasn't concerned that I had a problem with alcohol, and, um, and yet I didn't want to, you know, start having a problem with alcohol, so I did, I, as, and at the same time, I was putting together and um, doing tons of research on trauma and putting together a trauma um, healing small group, and so... I was learning all this stuff about tr trauma and healing trauma and, and trauma responses. And, um, and so I also knew that, you know, because I didn't, because I, the, the alcohol was a temporary fix, I wanted to get uh, therapeutic help as well. And so I, I went into therapy and I was able to, um, you know, like the, the biggest, my biggest issue at the time was confusion. Did I do something wrong? Was I bad? Um, and if I was bad, I wanted to find out how, and I wanted to change it. And that was a way of, you know, again, that's a way I, I, I had a habitual way of, tr of thinking. And um, it turns out my therapist said I wasn't bad. So anybody who thinks I'm bad, they're wrong, because my therapist doesn't think so. Um, <laughs> but nobody's bad. And then, I mean, I knew that a lot of this was irrational, but I also knew that, that there's things that... Um, you know, when you know too much, then you have, then you can become like worried about finding problems that you probably never would have worried about before. That's all to say that I recognized that there's this physical um, sensations. Oh, I also was having my heart hurt. And I, I uh, well, another reason I went into therapy is because I thought I was going to die. I thought if I did not take this, I thought I was going to die of broken heart syndrome and, um, I wanted to be responsible with my life and not leave my family because my heart was hurting. So, and this wasn't just like a thing that I came up with. It turns out, through all this um, study about trauma, that that the when you're traumatized, um, either a, in a one-time event or if you have, whether it's acute, like a one-time event or or if it's chronic, when it happens over and over and over again, there's a pr part of your brain is stimulated to have different responses. And, and the, the names for these responses in some, theor in some theories is called fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And whether we recognize in the past what has happened, what um, the, the, because, and we, and we might not always recognize what has happened, the responses that are triggered, those responses are, are triggered in a part of our brain that doesn't have, isn't cognitive, it's not language. It's not like, I'm going to choose to, f to flee right now. I'm going to choose to fight right now. It's part of our brain that is, is um, behind the part that's actually making cognitive choices. And so the fight response, all, all these responses would be great, like they're, they're, they're built into us for our survival. Just like if you think about like a, a deer, um, you know, who come like a, I don't know, predator, would, a wolf or something would go against the, um, co come against the deer and the deer would run right away. If they didn't run one right away, then they would get eaten by the wolf. So these responses are made for our survival. And yet, um, and yet when, because, because they get, um, unless they're able to be acted out in a safe and um, you know healthy environment, or they're able to be worked out immediately, then they get stuck. And so a fight response um, looks in the present as you know being argumentative or being controlling or um, or or collecting or or, or trying to. Um, protect oneself, like really, really hard. 
in many different ways, even and, and at times when that's not necessary. It can look, it can work itself out in what looks like irrational conflicts, like you know somebody snaps and they're all of a sudden yelling and and um, and they don't know why. It's because that fight response is still being activated. A flight response has to do with wanting to run, and and it would you know it's good in if you're being chased by a, a wolf, but if you're just in a room of people that aren't going to harm you, it um, can act out like anxiety, and you know like there's a chronic sense of um, something's wrong or something's going to happen. What's going to happen next? Of the another shoe going to drop? A freeze response is a, a, um, sometimes it looks like a dissociation or um, like blanking out. Sometimes it's, it's just kind of like if, if it gets triggered, then you might notice yourself or someone else just kind of like blanking out and not paying attention. It's a disengagement. And sometimes freezing in a, in a terrible situation, if you can't get away from it, is the only thing you can do, and it saves you from being caught by the... But you know, be, it saves you from death ultimately, or or um, you know, or or having to deal with something that you can't deal with because there's no escapable solution. And yet, if it's happening in the present, it causes problems because you're not fully being um, aware of what's going on, and it can inf it, it can diminish your sense of living fully, and it can diminish your relationships because you're not able to connect or have intimacy. And a fawn response is just complying. You know, if, if, and then we're taught to do that nowadays. It says, you know, like if, you, if someone wants to take your purse, you just give it to them, right? You don't say, um, because you're, most, you're less likely to get hurt if you, you know, if you give them your purse rather than if you say, no, I want my cell phone. Um, and so the fawn response, you know, if you're a child, if the choice is, you know, death or severe harm or less harm, um, you'll choose the one that's gonna your, that'll make you survive. And yet, those responses are taking place in a part of your brain that may not always have words. And, and they may keep you safe in an acute moment or if you're in an environment where it is unpredictable and you might not be safe and, and um, you might be responsible to, to meet your own needs for safety or security or anything else. Those things can, you know, at the time be helpful, but they, they can't last, and they weren't meant to last. They take an enormous amount of energy from the, as in surviving, and they don't allow you to have the energy for playfulness and creativity and intimacy and um, enjoying beauty, the things that we were made to do in life. So getting back to my response at that time of like, what did I do and, and, and what's wrong and how come my arms are hurting, I've come to think that that was directly attached to a time when um, I was 18 months old and my parents had like let my um, aunt and uncle watch me for a week while my mom had a new baby. But prior to that, I was the apple of my mom's eye and I didn't even, you know, like I probably wasn't even differentiating from her very much because I was always with her and she was always doting on me. And, you know, for some of you who have had much rougher childhoods, that looks like, well, what's your problem then? But the problem was it was abrupt. I was 18 months old and I didn't understand. And as because the enemy is like a roaring lion always looking for ways to steal and kill and destroy, but the enemy must have come and told me, well, this is your fault. You did something wrong. You're not good enough. And then, you know, like after a week, my parents came and got me again, but there were, you know, there was, I was, I was also in a place where, you know, I was, I, they, my, my aunt and uncle had four other kids. I was likely in a, um, playpen for a long amount of time, not exploring. I was, um, you know, I wasn't do diagnosed with attention deficit disorder until I was 47 years old, and yet it probably was acting itself out when I was 18 months old as well, and so there's probably a lot of misunderstanding 
about you know, my creativity and my wanting to run around and, and also having to be put in a, a playpen the whole time. Um, what I was feeling was the sense of being stuck. The sense of, as a child, you know, like as a child who's 18 months old and, and was be, you know, being delighted was now in a, a wooden playpen with bars. Um, and I'm sure it was very confusing. Because there's another memory I had. And it was when I was about three years old and we were up in Wisconsin and my mom had, for some reason, taken me and my younger brother, who was 18 months old at the time, out fishing. And we were in a little motorboat and we got out to the other side of the lake and um, my the boat motor stopped and my brother had dropped this net into the the water and my mom was watching this net fall down and, and my mom had already had terror about us dro drowning in the water and she um w was she just started crying because she thought for sure we were going to drown and and I at that time thought mom I, and I said to, my, my mom's told me this that told this story in front of me since I was three years old so apparently I said it's okay mama I'll roll us home and my and I like must have started rowing this boat home, and I'm three and I'm a little little girl. And yet, uh, my mom then, you know, was wasn't there. So he, there was a thing that would have been normally um, a time when the adult would take care of the situation, but because my mom was being triggered into her own situation, and my mom was a delightful person, but she was triggered, and she was in despair, and so I, like, sucked it up and thought, I'm going to take care of this. And that in combination with, and, and, I, and I, that in combination with the sense of, like, well, I can't do anything wrong because I might get a, abandoned, and it will, you know, doing something wrong would be unsafe for me, and um, the sense of I have to be the one who solves the problem that I, you know, gained apparently when I was three, and probably, you know, t prior to that, there was a sense of, like, this is just my role in life, and so I became an excellent problem solver, and in the family system role, whether or not my parents saw me as the problem solver, I took myself way too seriously for a three, four, five, and six, and seven, you know, year old, and became this, you know, um, in in adult language, I uh, would think that I I always thought I was the strongest one in the room, and so so having had this sense of the, three years ago now, having had the sense of you know abandonment, in combination with I always have to be the strongest one in the room, and and I, I didn't feel strong anymore. I was really struggling, and my arms hurt. And we're gonna go get back to the rest of that story later. But just, just if you can think of a time um, that that m something, not necessarily my story, but other stories in your own life, may have have attributed to some of the things that you may have felt um, negatively in the more recent past. So just keep that in mind. And, and not only that, but some of the ways that your body responded to those feelings in the more recent past. What happens when we experience um, trauma is, um, and this is according to the book, Oh, it didn't write. The body tells the story or something. I, I meant to read, but it's by Bessel van der Kolk, and um, and this is about trauma and lots of trauma people uh, quote from him because he's foundational on this the study of trauma. Um, but he says this: we have we've begun to understand how the overwhelming experiences affect our innermost 
sensations in our relationship with our physical reality, the core of who we are. We have learned that trauma is not just an event that took place in the past. It's also the imprint left by that experience on the mind and brain and body. The imprint is the ongoing consequences of how the human organism manages to survive in the present. Trauma changes how we think and what we think about. Helping trauma survivors find words is important, but it doesn't always change the physical and hormonal responses that continue to happen. The bodies of survivors continue to remain hypervigilant, prepared to be assaulted or violated at any time. For change to happen, the body needs to learn that the danger has passed and to live in the reality of the present. There's often... Um, and so this is often the process of healing from the past. So recovery isn't just about learning and accepting what happened to you. It's also about gaining mastery over those internal sensations, the part of your brain that doesn't have the words to just explain what's happening. Um, and so the reason that these memories are so dominant is that, is that and it's difficult... Um, to feel alive right now is that when we are overwhelmed and hypersensitized um, by the active part of our brain, then we, it's really like that's reacting to the past. It can't really be fully present right now. And so we will sometimes go back and, and start refeeling or rethinking about those times that actually hurt us because that was times that we felt most alive and the trick is to bring healing to that so that we can actually feel most alive now and we don't talk about this very much in the church which is why I'm talking about it now because when we come to the church and we just look at well the past is the past then it and, and we just have to like move on and put to death the flesh then, and it reinforces parts of um, the lie that says, you know, that we've continued to live out. You know, if the past is the past and the flesh is the flesh, then there's no good reason why I should be this way, and now I'm in trouble. And so we have this conflict of, well, there's no shame and condemnation, and yet we're feeling extreme shame and, con and, and um, condemnation because we can't get over something, because we're feeling pain, because we're feeling anger, because we're feeling hurt, or because we don't even know what, what those words are, but something feels off. And we have a backache, or stomachache, or we have chronic headaches, or we're having intestinal problems, and, and, our, or, and, like, and there's pains in our hearts, and in my case, my arms. Um, it's because we have been told too often that that doesn't matter but but um in the old testament and i tried to find the scriptures and yet there were too many scriptures so i'm just going to tell you how the old testament works out in these kind of situations a lot of times the prophetic books were written to people who whose communities were wiped out they were um they were they were like wars came upon them. They were exiled, and they were in tr you know, and they felt like they had a, a sense of like, well, God's abandoning us, and we're in trouble. And then p these prophetic words would come and say, "But I never ab abandoned you. But I'm going to come and collect the exiles from the east and the west, and they're my sons and daughters. And there's this love." And looking back, you know, and it says like the. In the Old Testament, it'll say, like, I only abandoned you for a little bit, and now I'm here to get you. And we know that God never abandoned his people, but the, but the power of those words to these people groups that were questioning and wondering, why is, does this suck so bad, <laughs> was incredibly powerful because it said, you're not in trouble, and I still love you. And when we... Um, apply that same kind of love that God had for this, you know, these tra traumatized people groups to the traumatized parts of our body and our mind and our souls, we can realize that the parts that have felt exiled, the parts that have been set apart that we didn't look at, we don't want to look at, that 
God never was saying, good, we're rid of those fo folks. And now we can just suck it all up and, you know, get along in our present life. He's saying, I'm going to find you. In the New Testament, there's a story about Jesus leaving the 99 sheep to find the lost sheep. And Deb's actually here this morning, and she has this beautiful picture that she wrote of Jesus carrying the sheep. And he was just like so in love with the sheep. And, and that's like how he feels about the parts of us that we have th thought were bad. And so we can't read the scriptures that say put to death the flesh and just, you know, be good now. You know, be perfect now, just like Jesus is perfect. As um, scriptures that say that never mattered. It's, you know, like, you're no good, you weren't good, and we just have to ignore that part. We can look, we can read the scriptures knowing that the ones that Jesus went out to look for, that he was gathering from the east and the west and the north and the south, is parts of us that are very valued and very loved. Now, when we grow up and we're, st we're stuck with these trauma responses, the trauma responses get attached to lies. Because a lot of times when something happens to a child or even an adult, when you think that there's no control, we're so egocentric, we think, well, you know, we must, you know, that, that person, especially if it's a primary caregiver that's causing us pain, we think, well, it can't be them because we need them to survive, and so it has to be us. And so we make judgments, and we make I, we we just start forming beliefs that say um, that tell us different things. And these beliefs, I don't think, come from ourselves. I think they come from the enemy, who's a liar. And the liar says it's not okay to make a mistake. You're not good enough. You're you know maybe you deserve this. Um, it's not okay to want attention. It's not okay to have needs. It's not okay to be afraid or sad or angry. It's not okay to cry. It's not okay to do something that's socially unacceptable. Um, and we start, we start living by these rules. And if we don't realize that those are rules that are put by the enemy, then we, we come into church and we, those things get reinforced in us. You know, if we're supposed to just be grateful for everything, just put on a happy face, God is in control, it, know that everything's going to be okay. If we just, you know, like try hard enough, if we just stop sinning. Sin is, is in the New Testament, was marked as unbelief in that Jesus was God. And it wasn't just a belief that Jesus was God. It was a belief that the love that came from Jesus reveals the love that God has for you. And so when we look at sin described in the New Testament, we're not looking for a list of rules and laws that are either written in the Old Testament or written in our society. We're looking at whatever we believed that said that we weren't good enough and we weren't loved is a lie. And that if we believe that the God that loves us when has found us, has gathered us, went out looking for us, left everyone else just to go out looking for us, then we can believe that, that we can be okay in Jesus. And it's when we come into the fold, when we come into the arms of Jesus, that we can start bringing healing to those um, parts of us. So Jesus didn't abandon us, and he's not abandoning us now. Like I, I talked last week for the need for therapy, for the need for, to revisiting, for the re, if you don't have, a, if, if you have somebody, a therapeutic friendship, it doesn't always have to be someone who is, um, you know, a therapist, but it also, it can't be someone who's um, going to be, you know, like going to be codependent with you either. It has to be someone who's going to help you help you because it's, it's we who reject ourselves and it's we who need to integrate ourselves back in. There's there's actual there's a whole bunch of different ways, the outside of the church that um, we get to fix that place between our brain and our body, or our brain and our cognitive understanding, or sorry, our body and our cognitive understanding. Um, full healing doesn't come until that those parts of us are fully connected, 
And so it's really important that we work on that because then we can not only have more compassion for ourselves, we can love, live more fully in the present, which is exactly what Jesus came to give us, which is the fullness of life. In the church, we do this um, by being safe. I mean, we first and foremost have to become safe people. So we're not, um, so, oh, here's the importance that, oh, let's see. Here's the, po- here's the importance that um, Vanderkolk says. Social support is not the same as merely being in the presence of others. The critical issue is reciprocity, being truly heard and seen by people around us, feeling that we are held in someone else's mind and heart. For our physiology to calm down, heal, and grow, we need a visceral feeling of safety. No doctor can write a prescription for friendship and love. These are complex and hard-earned capacities. You don't need a history of trauma to feel self-conscious and even panicked at a party with strangers. But trauma can turn the whole world into a gathering of aliens. So what we need to be is something other than a a gathering of aliens. The church can bring healing by undoing, first and foremost, the you're not okay messages. So in the church, so is is a healing church, the people that we want to be, we're going to stop giving messages that say you're not okay. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to want attention. It's okay to have needs. It's okay to be afraid, to be angry, to cry, and even to do something socially unacceptable. A lot of the things that we do that are socially unacceptable are things that we do to numb that pain, just like I was numbing the pain from my arms. In the, the healing small group we did, I, we did a, a, a day where I, we painted, and we painted pictures of ourselves and, um, as a little child. And, and the, the picture that came to my mind was of myself holding that little 18-month-old girl who was, who was left at her aunt and uncle's house. And that's the feeling that was why there was pain in my arms. Because I just needed to be held. I need to be held by someone who is stronger than the little me who took on the cares of the world. And it was really myself that I needed to be held. Of course, Jesus was always holding me. He had never left me. But he introduced me to that part that needed to be held. And my arms don't hurt anymore. And I don't go to alcohol for um, arm pain. Um, But there's, there's... a thing that um, happens in us when we're safe to just recognize and have compassion for what's going on in our bodies. My, um, I had a friend who had a, who had a story where something in her past where she had um, done something and she thought that it was that she was going to hell from it. That that Jesus hated her from it. And the reason she thought that Jesus hated her is because when she was on her way to do this thing that was excruciatingly painful for her anyway, there were signs that people were holding that said, Jesus hates you. And she had to um, beat herself up about that. And that part of her who felt Jesus' rage toward her um, developed a, a disorder that involved um, restri- food restriction, um, bulimia, and cutting. And it was because she thought that Jesus hated her so much. She didn't deserve to have good that other people had. And as we were talking, and as, we, and as this person was embraced in the love of Jesus, and the community that she had found within um, a, a, a loving group, she asked, I don't think that Jesus, I, I never really thought that Jesus loved me. And I said, why? And, I said, that's, and she said, that's because that's what the sign said. It said Jesus hated me. And I said, those people just didn't know. And another time she said, well, I just don't think that Jesus can love me because I do this, these things to myself. And I said, close your eyes and imagine the shame you feel when you're doing those things. And now look around, where's Jesus? He was right there. He never left her. He loved her when she was doing the things she was most ashamed of.
We learn about how to love and about the love of Jesus when we become the healing church, when we become the church that embraces the, the sheep that was lost far away. Not like, not like this horrible sinning sheep, but the one that people rejected in themselves. And we become the healing um, church when we, we say, oh, but Jesus loves you. We're going to get through this. And we're going to look at those things. And we're going to be with you as you go to therapy. <laughs> and we're going to be um, helping and hear and caring. And when you come into this place, it's not so you can feel real beat up and real shameful and try not to do the bad thing this week. It's going to be so that you know that that, that part that you thought Jesus hated, that he goes after you and is holding you. And then your body will calm down. And then your stomach might feel better and your back might feel better and your headaches might go away and you might be able to sleep. And we'll keep on praying, but we're going we're gonna to pray not only for the symptom, but for the, that child that just needs to be held. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that you go out and you gather us up. And Lord, we thank you that you have gathered here, us here this morning. And we just ask that um, as you are loving us and as we are still in that safe place, that you will begin to show us those that you've brought along, those that you loved and that you've gathered, that are here Amen. and that get to worship you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to say thank you for those who have continued to give. Uh, we, we don't take a regular offering by passing bags, but we do have lots of different options uh, online through your bank bill pay, um, writing good old-fashioned checks. If you're in person, we do have a drop box on the wall as you exit. And so we're just grateful for all who call Hope Vineyard home to participate in this act of being generous, just like our God is generous and sacrificial, just like Jesus expressed sacrifice for us um, and, uh, and faithfulness. He never leaves us, just like Dee Dee shared today. And so thank you for, for participating in the character of God uh, when you do give. And now as we continue our uh, worship time together, let's enter into this time of worship by saying together out loud the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
chance when I stand in your
we just thank you that you love us, that it's your love that we come to, that it's your love. Your love is welcome, your love is understanding, your love delights in who you made us to be. Your love even delights in our tears because when we bring them to you, you take it as like a light, um, your love delights when we give you our anger, your love delights when we give you our confusion, your love delights when we just give you our bodies and we say, I don't have words, but here we are. So Lord, we ask that you will continue to lead us into your truth, into your power, into your peace that part of us that, that just needs to know that we are safe in you. And Lord, make us safe people as individuals and as a community so that we can do our part as you lead us into fullness of life. loving and taking care of those parts of us that we abandon. Thank you for the survival that brought us to this place, to this moment in time. And Lord, thank you for the fullness of life that you continue to lead us to, toward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, I'm going to just say, if you if you want prayer, um, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll come to you and pray. If you want to come up here, you can come up here. If you um, are more comfortable asking the person beside you to just say, God's doing something, and I don't know what it is, but I want to partner with that, and they can bless it. Um, if you're out there, same, th same thing goes. If you want prayer messages, if you are just saying, God's doing something, and I just want to say yes to whatever it is. And we want to, we want to bless that. And we'll try to do this work together. Thank you for being with us. Um, again, if you want to participate and you want further resources about the, um, I have the whole trauma, um, so it was soul care, uh, small group, uh, discussion guides that has lots of information and lots of resources and even though we're not doing the small group I would like if you want the, the guides you can um, c connect on our Facebook page and go to under to where it says more and then go down where it says groups and it's the fearless approach and on there I have posted a link to um, where you can get those guides and I'll try to have some you know just things that you can do if you want to comment, if you want to um, talk further, we'll do that on the Fearless Approach um, group on Facebook. All right. Thanks for being here. We'll see you all next week.